Hello everybody, <clears throat> this is Mike, and yes, I'm back, but just for this very special, unique time in our culture, which uh, is, we've there's a spotlight on narcissistic devaluation and behavior, <clears throat> which is, of course, as you well know, the slap heard round the world. What is really going on? What is behind that behavior? Will slip, will slip. Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. What is behind all of that? So perhaps like many of you, I was not uh, up to date on all of the gossip between Will Smith and Jada Pinkett and, you know. Um, now I am of course, because uh, they, on an unconscious level, they want to play out their abusive narcissistic relationship, uh, not only with them, but with their family for the whole world to see. So make no mistake about it. Um, as Denzel Washington said, although I don't know if he was coming from the same position as me, um, he said, cryptically, he said, this was a long time coming for Will Smith. Now, uh, if you don't know anything, you would think, oh, he and Chris Rock have got something going on, and this was a long time coming. No, it was, this was Will Smith's breakdown, and it was a long time coming. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the Karpman Triangle of Abuse and how that plays out in this. Um, we'll, of course, take a look at uh, what we know, what we factually know because of their public revelations about uh, their narcissistic, dysfunctional, codependent family and relationship. And um, if I have time, I will play Will Smith's acceptance speech and I'll give you my take on what he's saying, which shows um, what's going on. Now, um, my last bit of uh, research for this as I came on here today, you know, I, I purposefully waited a long time to say something, to make a video about this because uh, I also want to talk about what how it affected me because I was traumatized by it. And that was confusing to me because it really wasn't that traumatic of an event. You know, I'm a martial artist. I like watching, um, you, you know, uh, UFC fights and, and um, boxing and things like that. So one man uh, harmlessly, physically at least, slapping another man is not a traumatic event. So, and, but it is traumatic to me. I mean, I can't watch it. Like if it gets replayed, I can't watch it. I shouldn't say I can't. It's difficult for me to watch. And it's because of the, the horrifically damaged narcissistic uh, dysfunction that is clearly, you know, the, it, it's, it's an incredibly abusive moment. You know, the physical uh, slap is abusive, but that's not what's really the most abusive thing about what Will Smith did. Um, it was it was abusive to everybody, including me and you. Those of us who watched it were abused. We were traumatized by it. It was it was a desperate attempt to gain utter mastery and control in an abusive way of everybody, and in this case, pretty much the whole world. Um, we'll get into that. We'll see. I, I hope I can get to points without going off on too many tangents, but let's get started. So, um, I don't need to tell you what happened. The, uh, Chris Rock made a joke about uh, at the Oscars about uh, Jada Pinkett's hair, l likening her to G.I. Jane, the movie G.I. Jane uh, with, uh, I forget her name. And that was a movie where you had a woman with a shaved head. Um, and so he was 
doing what comedians do, and he was roasting the the royalty. That's the one time, you know, one of the few times that royalty, because that's how we view in America, that's how we view, you know, Oscar winning uh, actors or actors of that level, superstar celebrity actors. That's, you know, the one time that they get to be roasted and made fun of, uh, sometimes ruthlessly, in front of the whole world. And it's sort of like a rite of passage. And it's, um, and that was what was happening there. There's, uh, we don't know whether or not uh, Chris Rock knew anything about Jada's alopecia. I didn't. So uh, that was one of the shocking things about it for me. Uh, let's talk about what actually physically happened because that's important. And then uh, I'll try and get into the specifics here. But what actually physically happened is you have that day or the day before, I don't know which, Jada Pinkett goes on to her Instagram or her Facebook or whatever it is, and she uh, makes a video about how she has shaved her head because she has alopecia. And she makes statements like, and I don't care what anybody thinks, and it doesn't bother me, and I'm okay with it, you know, something along those lines. So she's already publicly brought attention to herself about it. She wants people's sympathy um, about her physical condition as well as the style look. Now, the truth is, she could have chosen to make that a style just like I have. Of course, for a woman to shave her head, it's more of a big deal, but she can get away with it for all kinds of reasons. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a style that, you know, she could have made a style out of that. And that's why I didn't didn't even dawn on me that she had alopecia because, you know, especially um, celebrities like to gain attention by doing big things and there's nothing wrong with that. That's their career is to constantly have attention on them. So for whatever reason, she shaved her head and she was proud of it. She went on and said that. And like I said, she's trying to get uh, attention. I'm not even judging that. There would have been nothing wrong with her saying, and I'm choosing to do this, and I'm not wearing a wig, and this is why, and just accept me for who I am, and um, all of that. So she says that. So there's already this, she's got a lot of, you know, she's out there, and she's wanting to say, hey, look at me, and have compassion for me, give me attention for this. Will Smith, obviously, this is a big, you know, even if he wasn't, if there wasn't all the codependence that's going on in, in their uh, in their narcissistic, clearly narcissistic relationship, um, he would have huge amount of emotions. The biggest, you know, the the like the pinnacle event for an actor, for a celebrity in the world is to get the best actor nomination at the Oscars. I mean, it's you can't get bigger than that. So he's, you know, at the at the pinnacle of his career, it's very unlikely that he'll get a second nomination for Best Actor at the Oscars. And um, it's also got a lot of uh, emotion around it because of the subject of the film. You know, he's playing, uh, it, it's, it's huge for, you know, African-American identity and all of that. So it's got all of this energy charged around it by itself and for him you combine that with clearly this narcissistic uh, relationship that he's got with his wife codependent relationship with his wife and you've got a powder keg ready to go off and the point one of the points i'm going to make is that this was actually on an unconscious level for both uh, jada and will smith this was the whole point of the abuse. This is a like a perfect storm for an abuser to manipulate their codependent uh, partner to destroy themselves. And so I am saying on an unconscious level that Jada Pinkett Smith really this was this was this couldn't have gone more perfectly for her 
So I'm obviously making the argument that Jada Pinkett Smith in this case is taking on the role of the abuser. And I do believe that she is uh, extremely psychologically abusive. Um, I don't know, I, I can't make a, uh, any kind of diagnosis. Um, but um, whether or not she has true NPD or whether she has BPD or comorbid bolt, or if she's just very narcissistic, I don't know. But this has all the harm hallmarks of, at the very least, uh, narcissistic personality disorder. The level of abuse that she has leveled on her entire family um, for years now and the level of psychological abuse uh, on Will Smith, and he's no angel here either, but um, I, in this relationship, he is the codependent uh, who's suffering the abuse. Um, this, this end result of him potentially, he, he could have gone to jail, um, but the, you know, the whole event was as close as you can get to somebody just absolutely dropping a nuclear bomb on their own success and their own career. You couldn't have done a, you know, you couldn't have picked a better place to do this. And uh, I'm saying that Jada Pinkett Smith, uh, this was her, she was setting this up. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not, I'm not saying that she's an evil mastermind that has the ability to make things like this happen. Will Smith is a codependent. So he is a participant in this. And so within him, there had to have been the seeds for um, his own devaluation. He must have on an unconscious level some severe self-hatred to just in such a crazy way nuke his entire relationship and do it in front of the whole world so that the whole world hates him. You know, um, there's only a small minority of people who think that he did the right thing. And even those people are getting off on his own self-destruction. But I'm saying that this was, this is the end result of a narcissistic relationship. And for those of you who've watched my channel, you know, this is the end result, what I call the final discard with borderlines, with, um, we don't know what's going to happen in their relationship, but this could be the perfect setup for the final discard. Now we'll see what happens with Jada, but if she ends up discarding him after this, this will be, you know, because this is what narcissists do. Narcissists and borderlines and narcissists and borderline personality disorder is a form of narcissism. And, um, you know, their ultimate goal is the ultimate devaluation and destruction of the other, which, of course, is their projection of their own experience of themselves. And this is perfect. I mean, you couldn't get more perfect than this. So all of that background, uh, Chris Rock comes up. And he's roasting the, the, um, uh, the, you know, he's even got the name King Richard uh, uh, in that movie. He's roasting the royalty and he makes that remark about uh, G.I. Jane. And here's what ends up, here's what actually physically happened there. Will Smith is sitting there, everybody's looking at him and all the cameras are on him because he's up for an award and Chris Rock, there's a racial aspect to it, too. A fellow black man is coming up. This is a big night for African-American uh, self-esteem and all that kind of stuff because of all this stuff associated all the way around. You guys can figure that out. And so Will Smith is there, and he's, you know, he's enjoying it, and, and Chris Rock makes the joke. Jada Pinkett Smith, Smith, I love you. Can't wait to see you in G.I. Jane 2. And Will Smith laughs. He's not faking it. Now, I mean, it's he's got the cameras on him and he's supposed to laugh. He's supposed to enjoy that. And he laughs. <laughs> and it, he laughs so loud that you can hear it. You can hear it on the mics pick it up. Jada, 
we see her uh, um, express um, that she's been uh, har harmed by this. She shows uh, emotional trauma at this. She is sensitive to her alopecia. She wants people to whatever she wants. Positive attention, but you know how narcissists are. They also love to be the victim. I'm not saying her, you know, right or wrong, how her feelings should be. I think they could have gone either way. Obviously, somebody who really was comfortable with themselves would have heard the joke for what it was and would you could have even stood up and flexed. You know, I am a strong woman and people would have clapped. It would have been uh, an empowering experience for everybody. Will Smith could have gone over and kissed her on the bald head. You know, there could have been so many other responses that they could have done had they been comfortable with themselves about it. If she had been comfortable about it, uh, there could have been a different response. And nobody would have thought about it. In fact, if, they ha if nothing had happened, we wouldn't even be talking about it. It was a bad joke, meaning it wasn't that funny. It wasn't well crafted. It was just, you know. So Will Smith laughs, clearly not offended at all. Jada Smith rolls her eyes and then, you know, uh, makes a makes a gesture of self-comforting. She comes in on herself and she grabs her hand and then she she glares at, you know, under her eyelids, glares at Chris Rock. That's when Will Smith gets up. He gets up only when that happens. And then, of course, he walks up. It's very clear, I, you know, it really annoys the crap out of me that people want to say that this is staged and it's just because it's so cool to, to you know, say that everything is, you know, staged. Um, but it clearly wasn't. Uh, Chris Rock is like leaning, trying to see under the lights. He's leaning into Will Smith as Will Smith is walking up and Will Smith smacks him and... Um, you know, there's all kinds of body language going on there that says that this was not planned. And um, and then Will Smith sits down smirking. He's happy about it. And Chris Rock, being the professional and clearly um, emotionally mature person, responds in a very mature way and, you know, had to, had to address it, but didn't attack back and even tried to calm him, calm uh, Will Smith down after Will Smith says twice, take my wife's name out your fucking mouth. And he goes, I'm going to, you know, he clearly understands that Will Smith is not okay. And he, you know, it was, a, it was, it was as loving a gesture as somebody could do in that moment. And I thought it spoke a lot about him and his ability. And then he went on and did his job and presented the award he was supposed to present. You know, good for him. Um, but Jada Pinkett, we could make arguments that she might have been traumatized by it, but something weird was going on because, you know, uh, she's watching as Will Smith is going up there and Will Smith smacks him. And then uh, I don't know what was, I don't know, I don't remember what Chris Rock said, but um, not everybody knew that it, it wasn't, staged and uh, she laughs so she laughs at it I mean we see her rocking back and forth as she's laughing at the fact that that her husband just smacked some guy we'll give her the benefit of the doubt she didn't know about it but then Will Smith starts in on his rageful attack which I think was the most abusive part of it that was the most abusive part because that's where everybody went, <gasps> including me. That was the most traumatic point of it was the smack was traumatic, but his verbal abuse, you know, the controlling, you know, basically uh, shaming him and controlling him and and um, basically shutting him down, you know, you know, not he's somehow he has the authority to tell him not to speak and what he can talk about and what he can't. And that is a very abusive, devaluing, demeaning um, thing. That was the most, you know, that, the, again, that's what I remember too. And that was, that was the most traumatic part for me was his 
verbal assault on him and his uh, abusive control, not allowing him to speak. That was, that was the worst part for me. And um, so that was the whole setup, right? Then, as we know, what ends up happening is that the academy, the police are there, as I understand it, and the police are saying, we will arrest him right now. In, on camera, we will put him in cuffs and take him out. And Chris Rock apparently has the ability to approve this or not, and he declined to press charges. And the Academy could have done the same thing, and they declined to do that. Apparently, they asked Will Smith to leave, and surprise, surprise, he doesn't leave. Of course not, because he's up for best actor. That's the whole reason he's there. So, I mean, his ego is not going to let him walk away from that and then he gets the award and he goes up and he gives his speech which i think is extremely telling all right so i, I tried to do that in a short amount of time but you can't there's too much going on so now let's talk about what we know and why i now know how this is a narcissistic abusive relationship and how jada pinkett smith in the Cartman Triangle is playing out the role of the abuser. So what is the Cartman Triangle? Um, the Cartman Triangle, I don't have a graphic for you, but imagine a triangle. And you've got a, a triangle with a point down at the bottom and then the two sides at the top. On the left, we have the persecutor. And imagine there are arrows going in both directions, which means that in the Cartman Triangle, each one of the players in this triangulation um, changes characters depending on you know how to get their needs met and how to keep the drama going because the drama never resolves itself um, so in this case we have the persecutor so in the beginning the persecutor is the comedian now comedians that is their job it's lighthearted and it's actually a form of, uh, you know, a, a compliment to, to people. If you're, you know, if, if, a, if a comic is, is using somebody in the audience to make a joke, they are playing the role of the persecutor, but we all know it's in good fun. So in this case, Chris Rock is the persecutor. The victim in this, in the beginning scenario, is... Jada Pinkett Smith, because she is the victim. She has alopecia, which is a, an immune system disease. And, you know, for a woman uh, to have her hair taken out and she has to shave her head. And so she's like, in, you know, showing her shame to the world and she's a victim and we should all, you know, and I got nothing against that. You know, if somebody needs that. We can give them that support. She needs the support. She's the victim here. She's the vulnerable victim. And then, of course, Will Smith is the rescuer, the hero. And so this is the Cartman Triangle. And so the comedian gives the, the, the joke. It lands bad on Jada Pinkett. She is victimized. And Will Smith um, takes the codependent role. Uh, he takes the responsibility to protect and rescue his victimized wife. It's extremely codependent. She's perfectly capable of, you know, saying something. She could have said something. Um, she, she has all kinds of ways to defend herself. She didn't need him. This was extremely codependent. The underlying uh, dynamic is that if Will Smith doesn't do something, his, his victim wife has been uh, publicly humiliated in his mind, or at least she believes that. That's the, the weird thing is that he didn't think there was anything wrong with it, obviously. It was only, he only responded to her feelings. And the other thing that's interesting is that he didn't take care of her feelings. It, he made it about himself throughout the rest of the evening. He made it about him being this fierce defender of his family didn't make it about her you know he could have gone to her and taken care of her feelings he didn't do that so it's extremely codependent of him so that's the dynamic 
The persecutor, the comedian, Chris Rock, the victim is, uh, is Jada and the hero, the rescuer is Will Smith. And I'm saying this is a shifting of the roles and they needed a third person to bring out the triangle that's already there in their family. There's, there's already this triangle going on. So um, here's what we know. This is what I'm saying. So Jada Pinkett Smith has been very vocal about her uh, trauma. I don't know the specifics. I just know that she's talked about you know, her childhood issues, childhood trauma. She's very open about that. We know that uh, at some point uh, she makes the decision that she's going to be in an open marriage with Will Smith. She even says earlier, you know, that, um, you know, in, in one of her very public interviews, which is also very interesting, she's been extremely public about, you know, airing her dirty laundry and all of the drama, you know, of her of her family to the public. She gets off on the whole world seeing all of this. And um, she's been very vocal about she didn't want to get married. She didn't want to have kids. And the only reason, according to her, that uh, Will Smith and Jada Pink had gotten married to begin with was because she got pregnant. And she says Will Smith wanted to have a family. So Starting the the whole thing starts off with her feeling like she's going to codependently victimize herself, you know, and uh, do something she doesn't want to do. So she goes into the into the marriage uh, with a resentment, a resentment about having to have a kid, and a resentment about having to be married, and clearly a resentment about having to be um, having to be uh, monogamous. Because I'm quite certain that they didn't talk about, hey, you just got pregnant. And then there's that whole thing. I mean, you know, that he didn't, for whatever reason, they didn't have protected sex. And it's not like they're, you know, meth addicts uh, living in a tent on the street and they can't afford condoms. I mean, you know, this was a, at the very least an unconscious choice. So from the beginning, we have this unconscious drama that they both, you know, sign up for. There's not even a, a question of, you know, getting... Uh, getting an abortion you know uh, she doesn't want to have kids they're not married and they haven't talked about getting married you know i mean there's just so many things that could have been done she just decides to to make the one decision that's going to create the most drama she's not alone it happens every single day there's a reason why i'm single and i don't have kids that's one reason because uh, i don't want that responsibility um so she says at some point during their marriage, after they've had at least two, I think both of their kids. Um, and again, she doesn't want to be married. She doesn't have, have a, want to have a kid. And she ends up having not one, but, you know, the first one she couldn't help. Whoops, mistake. But then they chose to have a second one. So they're heaping all of this drama on themselves that they, according to her, she didn't want to begin with. Setting up for her to be acting out uh, passive aggressively at the very least, if not outrightly aggressively, which I find her to be extremely abusive. Um, so she decides that they have an open marriage and she publicly throws that out for the whole world to know that she wants to be in a, in an open marriage. And, um, so she's telling the whole world, my husband isn't good enough for me. I need somebody else. And it's not like he's somebody who has, you know, that again, I have nothing against people who choose to live that way if that's what they are built for. And there's no shortage of people that come together because they both want to be in open marriages. They want to be swingers. They, you know, all of that. Um, but in my experience, you know, this has the, this has all of the hallmarks of what people call polyamory. And again, I got nothing against that. If you truly have two people who truly are polyamorous, uh, and agree to do that. I, I personally don't think that polyamorous marriages are, <laughs> you know, I've never seen it work out well for any for anybody. It's always damaging to somebody in the relationship. There's always somebody who's being abused by it. It's a very, it, it can be a very abusive weapon. 
And in my experience, um, polyamorous relationships start with one person who's afraid of commitment and um, they're afraid of intimacy. And so they end up with somebody that gets very attached to them because narcissistic people are very good at finding people and making them feel really loved and safe. And then, of course, um, introjecting the uh, the lack of safety, the trauma, which again, just which is, you know, they look for codependents who've come from that. They play the role, whether they choose to or whether they're manipulating, we could argue, but they the love bombing is about I'm going to fix the damage that was done to you. I am going to balance out the insecurity you grew up with. I will be the person that will always be there for you. And then once they, through the love bombing, they establish the, the love and the, the codependent's need. Because the codependent, in order to be a codependent, has to have a need to be loved, not just a desire, but a need. And once that need, they become addicted to it, then you've got power over them. Once you become indispensable, which is the whole point of love bombing. The whole point of love bombing for the narcissist or the borderline is to make the codependent feel that that the, the narcissist is indispensable to their happiness, that they can't live without them. So the love bombing, that's why it's so damaging, is because the intent is to give the codependent the feeling that they are now finally safe and I acknowledge your need that you are going to be so attached to me that you will need me, but I am going to heal that need so that you never have to be traumatized again. And of course, once they establish that, then the fear of intimacy, the fear of, in the case of the borderline, the fear of engulfment kicks in. And uh, then they do the opposite. And then they introduce a uh, complete lack of security and safety, which then re-traumatizes the codependent, which gets them on the, um, the, you know, the abuse uh, hamster wheel. Um, what do they call that? Uh, there's a word, you know, you know what the word is, where the trauma bonding. So that's what creates the trauma bond. In case you don't know, what, create, what really uh, super glues the trauma bond isn't just the love bombing. The love bombing makes the promise of, I'm going to be there for you. I am going to always take care of you. I will fix. In fact, I remember my borderline saying these exact things to me. You know, after me talking about the trauma of my, you know, borderline uh, mom and, you know, how she, she abused me and um, her saying, I'm going to fix all the pain, you know, and me talking about the trauma of losing my, uh, my soulmate who died of cancer. She's like, I'm not going to get sick on you and die. I'm, we are, and she even said, we are going to fix all of these things within you. Um, and so that is, she was consciously saying it, but that's the, at the very least, the unconscious message that the narcissist gives in their love bombing, which is, I am going to fix the problem. And then what creates the true trauma bond is when they betray that promise with the, uh, you know, the, the threat of abandoning you and uh, not loving you or, um, you know, not approving of you or shaming you, which is the same thing. That's what then creates the trauma bond because then the codependent becomes um, helplessly now devoted to proving to the narcissist that they are lovable, which is Everything that happened in this slap, when Will Smith walked up and slapped Chris Rock, that's what he was portraying. He was saying to Jada Smith, I'm going to prove to you that, I, that, that you will finally love me and I will finally get your love. Now, as um, you know, somebody who's interested in this subject and has personal experience in this kind of dynamic, my first thought about Will Smith is there's got to be some mommy issues. There's got to be. He is one of the most famous, uh, you know, he's attractive, he's desirable. I mean, he could have pretty much any woman he wanted. No two ways about it. That would not be a problem for him. Um, so he has chosen 
to, to stay with an abusive narcissist. He's chosen to do that. And the only way that that happens is if there's mommy issues. So I don't know anything about that. Uh, that is just a logical deduction, except that in his acceptance speech, he talks about how uh, his mom chose to be with her friends instead of being there for him. Now, maybe she's too old. I don't know. But that's just some evidence that says, you know, there's there's some devaluation there. Uh, so that would explain why he's with Jada Pinkett. All right. So Jada Pinkett uh, has, uh, openly says to one of the biggest egos in Hollywood, says publicly to the world, not to him, but triangulate. The triangulation there is the public is, you know, is part of the triangle. She triangulates to the to the public. In case you don't know what triangulation is, it's when, you know, you and your uh, sibling are fighting and um, when your sibling is, is, you know, touching you or, you know, uh, hitting you or poking you, you say, Mom, Tommy won't stop touching me. And then mom says, Tommy, stop touching your brother. That's triangulation. When people come on here and do it all the time and they, you know, they don't like something I said, they, they will triangulate and say, you know, Dr. So-and-so says this, so you're wrong. You know, and that's triangulation. Happens all the time. Um, happens with, yeah, anyway. So the triangulation is we, the public, are, you know, because we have all the power. Because without us, Will Smith has no celebrity. So we really have all the power uh, as, a, as a whole. I mean, his whole life is, is devoted to getting us to love him and accept him. That's the nature of being in uh, that business. Without the audience, you can't perform. And so she is triangulating with the world by saying, I'm in an open relationship. And she does that. And that can't do anything but be hurtful to him. And it's the ultimate control. Because now he has to respond to the people whose uh, approval he wants most. And so if he responds badly, then you know, he doesn't get the love and approval that he wants. So that puts her in a real situation of control. It's incredibly abusive, telling the world, uh, you know, I'm in an open marriage. In order to save face, later on, he, in GQ, goes to us, the public, and he says um, that they have evolved beyond monogamy. So now it's like, yeah, of course I'm okay with her having sex with other men. I'm above all of that which of course is her manipulation. She obviously came to him and in whatever way said, you know, if you were a real man, you know, if you're really evolved and what are people going to think if you get so upset, if you were, if you really loved me, you would rise above this. And then he's got this poem that he's given to her, which says, uh, I'm going to, instead of try and have you be what I want, I'm going to love you for who you are which is typical codependent speak for don't leave me. I will, you know, I will justify and spiritualize my addiction to you and my willingness to be abused by you uh, in the hopes that you don't leave me. Right. So this is all played out for the world. That is bad enough. But then it gets uh, really bad and we see how abusive she is. And again, I'm not judging her, like looking at her judging. Her. I'm going by her actual behavior that is there for the whole world to see. This is what lets me know she's very likely got some kind of personality disorder. If not, she's very close. I mean, the level of, of narcissistic, uh, you know, lack of empathy, it points to probably a personality disorder. Um, but she, she then after, you know, according to Will Smith, he says he's done with her, uh, and he has broken it off with her, even though they're still legally married, he has separated from her. So then in order to get his attention, uh, cause you know, a narcissist can't tolerate not having all of the attention, um, 
you know, he's actually on the verge of individuating. You know, he's taken enough abuse uh, and it's been painful enough. And according to him, he said, I was done with her. I was done with you, he says. Um, in their famous, you know, red table talk where they really just so narcissistically and so, I mean, just it was sick. The, the a level of, you know, garbage that they're that like they ha again, we're the 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 third part in the triangulation where where Jada Pinkett Smith lit those red table talks, by the way, in case you don't know, those red table talks are about Jada Pinkett Smith coming to us, the most powerful people in their narcissistic world, because without them, they're not celebrities and getting us to approve of her behavior and getting and she's triangulating, trying to show us why other people in her life are her abusers, that she's really abuse victim of Will Smith. It was really awful. But that's what that's all about. And it's extremely codependent. And it's just sick. It just shows severe lack of um, individuation. Anyway, um, so uh, anyway, so he's split up with her and they're separated and he, uh, she starts a friendship with uh, a musician who is a friend of her son's. So this person that she had a relationship with was, a, was initially introduced to them by her, I think then 15 or 17 year old son, her teenage son. Teenage son comes and uh, has an older friend. He's at that point, I think he's in his early 20s. And he is an up and coming, you know, musician. And he introduces them to the family. And uh, they have a friendship or a friendship is, is created. And then Jada Pinkett Smith love bombs him. She's very open about that. She says that he was, you know, needy and he was sick and he had all these other things going on. He had all this pain. And so she then projects onto him and she becomes the rescuer in the Carpman Triangle. She becomes the rescuer with him and no doubt love bombed the crap out of him. Um, which I'm sure she did to to uh, Will Smith when they first met. She must have love bombed the crap out of him, seduced him, seduced his ego. And so she finds this, you know, up and coming, struggling, uh, talented, sensitive artist who's gone through pain, death in his family. He's got illness, et cetera, et cetera. So she love bombs the crap out of this guy, which then turns into a sexual relationship. I don't know what was said between them, but I can only imagine that she must have made all kinds of promises to him, uh, made, made him feel safe, made him feel loved. And they had, according to him, a sexual relationship for years. So much so that he says, uh, August is his name, August Alsina, he says that he gave, totally gave himself to her. So he was in a fully committed, he even remembers it as, at least I've done that. He says, I can die, something like, I believe he says, I can die now because I've at least given myself 100% to somebody. Very codependent. Nothing about her giving him herself to him or being there for him, but him needing to give himself to somebody else. He's now a good person. He knows how to love unconditionally. And um, her response is to... Uh, talk about him as an entanglement. And in that red table talk, Will Smith gets her to admit it was a relationship. So she admits that it was a relationship she was having, but she discards the guy by calling him an entanglement. And he's saying, you know, I, that he was hurt by it. I really gave myself to her, you know. So she must have given him the uh, feeling that they were going to be a lifelong partnership. Um, so that's bad enough in itself, but now we've got the devaluation of her son. 
So that is horrifically destructive and hurtful to her son. She has basically, you know, instrumentalized her son. Her son brings her a new relationship victim. You know, it's it's like having it's it's like rejecting your son, you know, and giving all of yourself to your son's friends. So she becomes, you know, uh, she has this relationship with her son's friend, incredibly destructive to the whole family. So it wasn't like she had met some guy over there and OK, and he's on the other side of thing where she's bringing it in. She's she's taking uh you know, he's become friends with Will Smith, with Willow, with the rest of the family. She's taking that and then, you know, sucking all of the uh, oxygen out of the room by making it about her. And then she goes on to say later in the in the Red, uh, Red Table Talks that she, the reason why she did it, she's saying this again to us, to the whole world, in, you know, and forcing Will Smith to sit there and take it. Now, he's, she's not forcing him. He chose to be there. But, you know, that's the essence of it. He has to sit there and be devalued in front of the whole world while she says, I just wanted to feel good. I just hadn't felt good for so long. And it made me feel good to give to somebody else that I, I fixed myself by giving to somebody else. And she makes no confession of the acknowledgement of how hurtful the behavior is to anybody. She's obviously completely unconscious to the fact that it's got to be incredible. I mean, there's a 15 year old kid, her son, he doesn't have the consciousness and awareness to know what's going on. It, it, it's got to be destroying him on. You know, I mean, he's going to have mommy issues. He's going to have I mean, just for that alone. He's going to have severe issues when it comes to trusting women. I mean, I, you know, his mom, you know, not only did she not value her commitment to her husband but on top of that she publicly humiliates her husband his father and then she does the same thing to him uh, and we know that he tried to get emancipated at the age of 15 right around this same time so he must have been very damaging to him and she shows no awareness that she has harmed anybody her only response was that i needed some healing I needed to feel good. And then she justifies it by saying, I learned so much about myself. So imagine everybody involved, the, the poor kid uh, or the, you know, the young man, um, August Alsina, he's like, oh, I'm glad that you learned so much about yourself. You took from me and then threw me aside. I'm speaking for him. I don't know what he would say. Uh, Jaden Smith is, oh, that's great. Thanks a lot, mom. You devalued me. You embarrassed me. You hurt my father and you brushed me aside or worse, you tried to be my mom and, you know, love me while you're screwing my friend that I brought, you know, which is uh, on an unconscious level. The uh, the uh, symbolism is screw you, Jaden. I now have a new son and I'm going to give him everything I didn't give you, you know, um, so. Uh, you know, I'm going to give him attention. I'm going to help his career. I'm going to, you know, you know, he's, she's got a young, uh, you know, a teenage son who wants to be a musician. On top of that, we have a very interesting dynamic, which plays out in Will Smith's self-destruction, which we'll talk about, which is Willow Smith. Now, I know nothing about her other than what she has said, which has come to light, which was that she was cutting herself. She was, the way she describes it, and I don't know what the timeline is here, I would be very interested to find out, but she was cutting herself when she was on the verge of having major success. She had just come out with her, um, you know, her little pop song about throwing her hair to and fro, and um, there was talk about, you know, you know, her moving forward, and there were like agents and other people like that, you know, trying to craft her career. And during that part where she had to differentiate, where she had to individuate and create, you know, um, a public persona, it's so tra traumatizing for her. She says, I didn't know who I was. And she started cutting herself. And this is very typical behavior of, you know, somebody who's raised in this very dysfunctional 
uh, you know, when you've got at least one of your parents is uh, a narcissist. This is a very typical behavior. This self-destructive, extremely self-destructive um, behavior of cutting yourself. Um, so we've got all this going on, and I am, I am squarely putting the blame on Jada Pinkett Smith. Will Smith, obviously, seriously codependent and um, allowing the behavior, uh, condoning the behavior, you know, supporting it. You know, he could have left her, which would have been a very positive and healthy thing for the kids because then they would have had at least one parent that would have been a stable place for them to go to. But instead, you know, he, um, ironically, you know, this fierce defender is, of his family, he ends up putting his children in greater danger by allowing his narcissistic wife to continuously have all of this control to do whatever she wants and to devalue uh, everybody in the family. So uh, let's move up now again to the slap. Um, alopecia, I don't know a lot about it. I'm making some guesses here, but you know, I have a personal experience with you know, I've had chronic pain before, and that is, you know, as a result of my uh, upbringing and the trauma that, that I went through. And I've learned that, um, you know, a lot of physical illnesses are a result of unresolved emotional psychological trauma, stress. And alopecia is one of these immune system disorders that uh, is often brought on by stress. So being a narcissist is a very stressful thing because as you know, at the core of the narcissist is trauma. They were traumatized as kids. It's unresolved PTSD, both with the borderline and the narcissist, it's the same cause. And of course, this uh, plays out in the rest of their life. And, um, you know, Jada Pinkett Smith, she has gotten by on her, you know, her good looks, her sexuality, her, uh, Obviously, she's she's very seductive and she knows how to seduce people. She's, you know, middle aged now and that's not going to work anymore. She's, you know, she just can't compete. Um, you know, she can't compete with 20 and 30 year old, uh, you know, good looking women, no matter how good looking she is. You know, she's never going to be what she was. That part of her life is over. The most powerful tool she had is over. So, again, I'm just making making guesses here, but I, I believe that's why Will Smith got back with her. I believe what happened was is that very likely, I don't know, but it certainly is possible that what could have happened was that, um, you know, this young guy that she was with uh, discarded her or uh, left her because of her abuse. She may have discarded him and then was unable to, um, to uh, hoover him back. There's evidence to this because around, you know, a few years after they get together, there's a song that he writes, which is clearly about her, which is called Nanya, which means none of your business. And it's about uh, an ex texting him about who are you with? Who is that woman you're with? And he's saying it's none of your business. You know, you could have had me and uh, you had the real thing and you didn't, you know, you whatever didn't take advantage of it. And so I'm going to be with whoever I want. And then he says, and you're just an actress. And in there on the picture of the phone in the video comes up Jada Pinkett, you know, in some actress role. It's obvious he's talking about her. So whatever happened, she either she devalued him or discarded him and then was unable to uh, hoover him back. No doubt throughout all of this, she is bouncing back and forth between Will Smith and August throughout this whole time, keeping Will Smith around, you know, because they don't get a divorce, even though he probably wants it. And then when uh, she's unable to, um, unable to, uh, to Hoover back August, then she goes and Hoover's back Will, who being the good codependent takes her back takes her back and decides to have whatever this relationship is. And, um, and I think that's because she knew she couldn't, you know, do what she normally does. So what she's going to do now is she's now going to play all that out with him. So this is when the real hell for him is going to start. 
if she's following, and you know, I haven't seen any evidence to show me that she's gotten any, any psychological help. The fact that she has alopecia means that now that she's, she's under even more stress because she can't get the narcissistic supply from uh, you know getting the sexual uh, uh, desire and the attention of a younger man, you know she's not able to do that anymore, and um, she's now stuck with the intimacy of a committed marriage, and that's going to bring up all of her shit. So she's going to now play it out in all kinds of other ways, and one of the ways is she's going to somaticize her her difficulty by losing her hair, and then she's going to use that as she has, as a way to take attention away from her husband, who's now, he's working so hard to get her love and approval, which he believes he has to do by being rich and famous, the most famous, the most rich. He even says uh, about her earlier relationship with Tupac Shakur um, that, you know, she, he, want, he desperately wanted her to look at him the way she looked at Tupac. So that means he's going to try and outdo Tupac in any every possible way, be a more successful musician, and he's you know he's getting more traction out of being a, an actor. So what does he do? He gets a role that gets him nominated to be a best actor. He is on the way to 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 achieving that, which in his mind is I'm going to get my wife's final. She's finally going to fall madly in love with me and accept me 100%. So what does she do? She, uh, she somaticizes uh, her, uh, her tremendous discomfort and then makes a victim uh, out of the fact that she's lost her hair. She's already gotten all of the attention. You know, just in her, uh, you know, her Instagram uh, post before the Oscars, she says, fingers crossed, and then she has all of these professional pictures of her in her gown, very professional, like lights and everything. I mean, she, she hired some serious photographers and paid them serious money to have her in her gown and to have her just looking, you know, like a queen. And there's no pictures of Will Smith in there. So as she's going on, you know, in her Instagram saying, fingers crossed, which just means, you know, she doesn't even mention him. Fingers crossed, let's hope Will wins. He deserves it. Good for him. My husband, I'm so proud of him. No, she shows only pictures of herself. And then, of course, you, the drama unfolds as we've already discussed. And if you look at it, that is her way of, I am going to devalue my husband. He is about to get all of the attention, the highest re uh, award possible, and I'm going to do everything in my power to bring him down. He is playing this out. He is also looking for an opportunity to destroy himself in the hopes of uh, defending her and getting her to love him. So, you know, if you've been in a relationship with a narcissist or a borderline, you know how you have wanted to get ahead of the abusers. So this is a very common thing. What happens is um, both borderlines uh, and uh, codependents do this, which is in order to get approval, they start to anticipate the devaluation. They start to anticipate the abuse. So they will abuse themselves, self-cutting, they will abuse themselves first, and it's a way of saying to the abuser, you don't have to abuse me. I already know how horrible I am. Look, look, I, I'm devaluing myself for you. Now do you love me? And so when the joke happened and Will Smith is laughing, clearly nothing about it bothers him. He doesn't, it doesn't even enter his mind that there's anything wrong with the joke. He looks over at her because she's, She's, uh, she's been hurt and she's glaring at him with these eyes of how dare you, you know, devalue me like this. And that's when that moment when he gets up to slap Chris Rock is the culmination of years and years of abuse. Denzel Washington had it right, had it right on the money. This has been a long time coming for him, meaning his own self-destruction. And his self-destruction was because, you know, again, I, it, 
it's clear, you know, it's strange to me that his mother chooses to be with her friends that night instead of be there with him. I don't know the full, but if that's in any way associated with her devaluing her son by saying, I can't be there, I have to be with my friends. You know, that just shows him that in order to get love, you have to devalue yourself. I personally, you know, I was in the uh, entertainment industry, although, of course, I wasn't at anywhere near anybody's level. But I was in Hollywood for a while and I did the Hollywood thing. I had a theater company and I acted on stage and I acted in films and in television. And um, I, looking back on it, one of the reasons that I didn't, uh, I wasn't more successful than I was is because I was programmed to devalue myself because um, my success was threatening to everybody in my family. If, if I did well, it threatened my father, even though he was incredibly successful in his field. Um, it threatened my brother. Still to this day, my brother blames everything. If he's still alive, he blames it on me and um, my mother. My mother couldn't tolerate the thought of me being separated from her and independent. And so on an unconscious level, I was always um, mediocre because that way I ensured their love. This was all on an unconscious level, of course. So on an unconscious level, Will Smith finally, you know, because once he gets that best actor award, what's next? He's no longer the cocky, young, uh, friends, fresh Prince of Bel-Air or the cocky, you know, uh, science fiction guy who's the, you know, the comic relief and all of that. Now he's a serious actor. And the only thing from here is, you know, there's, it's only, it's pure ultimate, the ultimate success, untouchable success. This is the success of the Robert De Niro's. And, um, you know, the highest of actors in the industry. Not only that, but he's represented African-American issues and brought them up, you know, and all of the glory associated with that. There's this is from here on out. I mean, it is ultimate true royalty and success. And so if he's going to destroy himself, this is the perfect storm, the perfect time to do it the perfect place to do it. And his wife with one glance, with one, you know, because looking at Chris Rock with daggers in his eyes, if she didn't look at him, which we don't know, but all she would have had to do was just one look at him, like, how dare you? How dare you laugh at that joke? When we get home, I'm going to destroy you. And so uh, all it took was either him seeing her you know, uh, with rage at uh, Chris Rock or at him for laughing. And his tremendous guilt kicks in this final piece and he goes out to destroy himself in front of the whole world in order to hopefully secure the love of the woman that he wants. So now let's uh, listen to him and I will give you my take on that uh, and to show you his unconscious. Bear in mind now he's he's accepting the award and this is after he has already been asked and I believe he knows that the cops are ready to uh, take him into custody. He's been asked by the Academy to leave and he has refused. And um, you know there's big actors there. There's Javier Bardem, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, I don't know who that kid is, but good for him. And then Denzel Washington, of course, you know, the tragedy of Macbeth. And here's Will Smith. He's kind of the underdog. But the thing about the Oscars is that the Oscars really isn't about the best actor. It's really kind of, it's, it's nepotism. It's really um, incestuous. You know, you've got the, you know, the elite of the entertainment community is voting on itself. So I don't get to vote on, you know, who's the best actor here or who does the best role. But there's always virtue signaling here because this, the person who wins the best actor award is usually not only done a great job, but that the subject matter is a tearjerker. You know, you, in other words, you never see, um, you know, people winning uh, best actor for being, uh, megalomaniacal murderers. 
You know, you wouldn't see anybody, even if they did the most brilliant acting job of playing Hitler, that person would never win the Academy Award because there's no virtue signaling in there. But Will Smith, who plays uh, a down, a struggling African-American dad who's bringing up these two, you know, Venus, you know, these two superstar uh, athletes in a white dominated sport of tennis. You know, this is hugely empowering for the African-American community. And of course, so the virtue signaling the best vote here is Will Smith. Denzel Washington is a, is a close second, but that's not nearly as empowering as Will Smith, who represents that. A guy comes from the street of Philadelphia, makes a name for himself and a blah, blah, blah. So um, that's why he wins this award. Let's just be clear about that. He's, I'm sure he did a great job. I didn't see the movie, but that's not the real reason. Um, so let's take a look here, because again, if you look at all Javier Bardem being the Ricardos, uh, Ricky Ricardo, I mean, I mean Desi Arnaz, uh, he's not the ultimate hero. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch plays a, I haven't seen the movie, but I think he plays a villain, so he's not going to win. Andrew Garfield, TikTok boom, I haven't seen it, but he's too young, but you know, it's a nod to him, a young guy coming up. Denzel Washington. Um, He's playing uh, not the greatest person in the world in Macbeth. So Will Smith is the logical choice. He's the greatest virtue signaling. And so let's be clear, when the Academy gives somebody an award, it's a reflection on them. Look at us. We acknowledge we're saying something politically correct. We're saying something racially correct. Will Smith, you represent us. And look how good we are. We're giving you this award. Just wanted you to be clear about the politics behind uh, awards. So let's listen to what he has to say, and I'll tell you, you know, how uh, all this has played out. And we'll see his unconscious, his unconscious codependence, where he is unconsciously confessing to what he's done, and his uh, narcissism and his, his inability to see the disconnect between what he's saying about himself and what he's just done. So he kisses Jada, claps for himself. I don't understand that. Goes up, gets some high fives. People are getting the standing ovation. He just smacks somebody in the face for absolutely nothing. And uh, all the big actors are handing him this award. Javier Bardem is clapping. Other people are clapping. They're clearly disappointed that they didn't win. And here he comes. Oh, man. Uh, Richard Williams um, was a fierce defender of his family. All right. So here he's going to obviously say that what he did was in defense of his family. In this time in my life, in this moment, I am overwhelmed by what God is calling on me to do and be in this world. All right, so now he's, you see him as the martyr. So in the Cartman Triangle, he is now the martyr. Don't be mad at me, I'm a victim. You have no idea what is uh, being placed upon me. Don't be mad at me for just physically abusing somebody. Making this film, I got to protect Ingenue Ellis. All right, so now he's going to show he's going to show you he's not a bad guy. He's not an abuser. I didn't just physically abuse an innocent person. I'm a protector. Look at me. Look at the hero I am. I protected this actress who wouldn't have been able to defend herself if it wasn't for me. Who was one of the most the strongest, most delicate people I've ever met. Yes, see, he's protecting the delicate. I got to protect Sanaya and Demi. 
I mean, the narcissism here. These are actors. These are professional actors. I don't, you know, I mean, everybody has to start out. I don't know anything about them. Maybe they're just starting out in the business. But this idea that he is this, this king of the world and he has this superhuman power to protect these professional actors who are doing their job. It's just incredibly narcissistic. And again, it's about, you know, I have the right to do this. You know, so now we're seeing his narcissism as he's taking on the role of both the abuser. He is now in the Cartman Triangle. He was the hero. And when he takes on the role of the hero, slaps Chris Rock. He has now taken on the role of the abuser, which is he has now taken all. He's taking the blame for the abuse of his wife in front of the whole world. He's sacrificing himself to protect and justify his wife's narcissism, her abuse. He's doing that, and he's now going to do what uh, narcissistic abusers do, which is, you don't understand. I'm doing this for you. You made me do this. I'm Now he's going to try and distract people and, and prove to all of us what a wonderful, kind, loving, you know, uh, wonderful protector and hero he is. He's Superman. So hopefully you'll be so blinded by all of this that you'll see how, what a great person he was. The two actresses that played Venus and Serena. I'm being called on in my life to love people and to protect people. Obvious who he's talking about. He's called upon by God to love people. Now, why, and he's really struggling. He's in a lot of pain here. He's in a huge amount of pain. And it's clear that loving people is extremely difficult for him. And we know who he's supposed to be loving. He's supposed to be loving his abusive wife who has devalued him and emasculated him her own son damaged her own daughter and she has done it publicly and she has now manipulated him right now in this moment what is happening if you go and watch him and you see in how much pain he's in what's happening in this moment is he realizes he realizes that he has he has been whether he's consciously aware of the manipulation he feels the manipulation he has been manipulated to abuse somebody else and, and to act out his wife's rage at herself and at him and at the whole world for whatever it is. And make no mistake, Will Smith was, was playing out her rage at the world because Chris Rock innocently said, good for you, you shaved your head, you're a strong woman. How dare you point out to me? Let me give you an example in my life. The last time that I saw my abusive older brother, was, uh, you know, he, my mom had uh, asked me to come talk to her and she was, she was about to ask me to take over um, the control of her estate because she was getting old. My brother was supposedly the executor, but he was, you know, he was not doing anything. And uh, so this was very, um, you know, uh, made him very uncomfortable. Anyway, long story short, my brother comes in after he interrupts my mom as she's about to ask me to take over uh, the estate, he walks in and, um, you know, distracts from that. And then he starts talking about how much pain he's in physically because he has this somaticized uh, issue, which is caused by stress. And he starts and he says the only thing that makes him happy is because uh, he used to race motorcycles, he used to race motocross. He says... You know, the only thing that makes him that that uh, sorry, the only thing that r relieves his physical pain is when he rides motorcycles. And I said, I said, in an attempt to be <laughs> supportive, I said, of course, because it, it makes you happy. I said, you should do more of that. He got furious at me. He got furious at me and threatened to shoot me with a gun. So um, this is what's happening here. His his wife is somaticizing her tremendous self-hatred and he now is going to sacrifice himself 
and he's making his defense. You don't understand. God is asking me to love this incredibly abusive woman, and it's my job. I'm the only one that can do it, just like he's the only one that can protect these two act these three actresses, you know, like you know, these are professional actresses and he has to protect them because he's Will Smith, the codependent protector of the world. And you don't understand what it's like to have all this, what God is calling me to do. I have to love people that don't deserve it, that are abusive, and I have to sacrifice myself to do it. That's what all these tears. When you go back and watch it and look at his face, this is what's really going on. This is a guy who's crumbling under the weight of this narcissistic codependent relationship. And to be a river to my people. To his people, there it is, he's like a god. You know, he's, he doesn't see himself as anybody else. He doesn't see that there are other people just like him. He is a protector and a river to my people. He's a king. I know to do what we do, you got to be able to take abuse. You got to be. When he says the word abuse, he says that it's filled with rage. If you look at his face, there's a close up of him and tears coming down. He says to do what we do, meaning actors. But he's also, you know, he's trying to say it's about being an actor. And look at us again. Look at me. You have no idea the pressure of what it's like being a celebrity and what we have to do and what we have to do we have to take abuse and the word and when he says abuse he, this this rage comes out of him again total disconnect from reality total disconnect um i'm an actor i don't know what it's like to be a big celebrity but i do know what it's like to be a lead actor in films and and in uh stage productions and all of that and um, to to take the privilege that he has to 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 create and to share his craft and bring joy to people and to not see that but to see himself as God putting him in this difficult position and you don't understand I've been forced to be this celebrity and I have to do this for other people. You know, it's like he's, you know, uh, like Gandhi or something. This shows his disconnect between what is really going on here, which is this is a guy who worked really hard to have his own success and he is in the height of his success. But now we see the true unconscious motive behind all of that success, which is I, you don't understand the pressure I'm under to get people to love me. And I have to love people who don't love me back. That's why he's so angry and so sad. And of course, the abuse he's talking about isn't the abuse of what? Chris Rock? Chris Rock didn't abuse him. It's the abuse that he's suffered at the hands of family members, in this case, at least his wife, who have been emasculating him and devaluing him from the beginning. And since beyond all, you know, he successfully, beyond all of his own internal negativity and the constant negativity that's coming to him, at least from his wife, devaluing him, and at the same time demanding that he be rich and famous to make her look good, but at the same time devaluing him, sleeping with other men, sleeping with her son's friends, uh, publicly airing all of their dirty laundry, emasculating him in public, and he has to do that in order to show how much he loves her. It's finally coming on him because now he was at the place where if he allows his success to really take hold, there's only one option, which is he has to individuate and walk away from this abusive woman, which is why he's saying all of this about, you don't understand how I have to do this for my people. That's what all this is about. Well, to have people talk crazy about you. His wife. His wife talks crazy about him. Now, of course, now he's fulfilling it because now we are talking crazy about him. In this business, you got to be able to have people disrespecting you. 
again, I mean, it's Chris Rock didn't even the level, even if we we don't give Chris Rock the benefit of the doubt and we say that he was abusive. I mean, the level of abuse was just irrelevant. The disconnect here. The disconnect here is just mind boggling. You know, this is a guy who's at the top of the world. He has nothing but privilege. The only abuse that's truly coming of any real value is coming in his own life and inside of him. And you got to smile and you got to pretend like that's okay. You got to smile and pretend that's okay. My wife has told me she's having an open relationship. My wife is having sex with, with my son's friend. My wife is abusing me at home. You have no idea. That's what he's talking about. But Richard Williams, and what I loved, thank you, D. Denzel said to me a few minutes ago, he said, at your highest moment, be careful. That's when the devil comes for you. That's exactly what's going on here. He's at his highest level. And again, if he, if he got through this and got to the other side, it would destroy his marriage. She's on a downhill spiral. She's, you know, the thing about men is as they get older, they become more seasoned. They become, you know, this is when men really hit their stride. In middle age, that's when they become the most successful actors as well. They don't need to be, you know, young and sexy because they, you know, they become powerful. And men don't age the same way. I'm, I mean, I'm 58 years old and I'm in the gym and I'm stronger than I've ever been. And most women, just the way men and women work, they start to change differently. They lose their sexuality. They, they hit their peak earlier than men do, especially in, um, in the acting. There's just, you know, you have to become a Meryl Streep or something like that. Because if you made your career by being beautiful and sexy, that's going to go away a lot more quickly than for a man. And he's on the verge of getting to that gold standard level of success. His wife, she's going, not only just naturally is she going downhill because, you know, she's not a young, beautiful woman in a, a sexist um, profession, but she now can't even grow her own hair. So she, she, she knows, she's got to know that it's downhill for her. So to have one person skyrocketing to the top and uh, eclipsing her, uh, if she's a narcissist, you know, this is, this is why this happened. This was an unconscious attempt to save his marriage because if he kept going, either she would have discarded him or he would end up, you know, having to leave her. Um, unless, of course, she got therapy, which I have no idea if she is or not. It's like, I want to be a vessel for love. I want That's why I slapped the guy in the face. Say thank you to Venus and Serena. I just spit. I hope they didn't see that on TV. Um, I want to say thank you to Venus and Serena and the Tyre Williams family for entrusting me with your story. That's what I want to do. I want to be an ambassador of that kind of love. The disconnect. He never once acknowledges the abuse that he's just given to somebody else. He's talking about how he's so disappointed and obviously incredibly disappointed in himself because he wants to be seen as a loving, kind person. That's what he wants to see. He wants people to see that in him. That's what he wants his wife to see in him. He, his kids, these people, he, you know, his, here's the thing. He's a human being. I, I don't know enough about him. I've heard both positive and negative. That happens in, in the entertainment business. Actors can be narcissistic and abusive. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they have a personality disorder. But, you know, actors, especially the more successful they get, tend to be 
tend to become uh, prima donnas. Um, but uh, there's a difference between that and being an outright abuser. I don't think Will Smith has a personality disorder. People have called him uh, a narcissist. There are people who have worked with him who have said that he was incredibly abusive to them. And I don't disbelieve that, but I think part of that just has to do with the nature of the business and um, you know the fragile egos of actors. Um, but the codependent in him, we see what he wants. This isn't honest, not honest, I shouldn't say honest, it's honest, his feelings are honest. Um, he, it, this isn't unconditional love. The love he's talking about is he desperately wants people to approve of him. And, in, and he has been groomed throughout his life in whatever way, at least in this relationship, that if he's a real man, he takes the abuse and he loves unconditionally or he's not a good person, he's not strong enough. His value comes from, as I've always said, what he does for other people, not for what he does for himself. And the thing about codependence is that they are narcissistic and abusive and they always end up taking out their aggressions and their narcissism on others. So the rage that he has towards whatever other things, but certainly his wife, he takes that out and has taken that out on other people. And we just saw that today. He took that out on Chris Rock. Um, and he, you know, normally that would be done where, where, nobody, where nobody sees it. Um, because then he would give a good face to the world. Like he says, you got to smile and pretend like it doesn't bother you. You know, you take the abuse and you don't let anybody know it bothers you. And what he, what he needs for his own narcissistic supply is to be seen as this loving hero, this Christ-like, strong Superman kind of figure that, uh, you know, is the most loving, wonderful, supportive defender of the innocent. And we've just seen him do the exact opposite. And what we now see is him mourning the loss of that uh, that, uh, you know, that narcissistic supply is now gone and he feels that. So his, when he talks about wanting to be a river of love and want all of that, it's not, it's not that he doesn't feel that desire, but it's also overshadowed by his codependent need to be seen as the perfect, uh, unconditionally loving um, codependent and care and concern. Um, I want to apologize to the Academy. I want to apologize to my, all my... Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. He goes on to apologize to everybody but the one person he needs to apologize to. He did apologize later, which, you know, here's the thing about, you know... Now, you guys understand. I hope you see, if you're watching this, you've been abused by your, your borderline. Codependents are narcissists. They're also abusers. It's a Cartman triangle. And we saw the triangle played out here today where he switched roles. You know, uh, Chris Rock came out as the, quote, abuser. He then became the victim. The victim became the hero and the abuser became the victim. Um, do you see how they all switched places? Now, Chris Rock doesn't have this dynamic, but, you know, they used he was a good excuse and he was put in that position and um to his i mean to his i gotta tell you I, i've played that in my mind and i wouldn't have been able to have responded that way i mean i probably he probably wouldn't have punched me because i'm you know i'm 215 pounds and you know i'm uh you know whatever other things are going on chris rock he has been abused as a kid and he's short he's obviously not uh, a, uh, a you know a, a fighter or anything like that he, you know he he has he had he carries with him that you know that victim vibe not that he's a victim but he was an easy target it was just the perfect storm had it been anybody else will smith wouldn't have done that um, you know, he picked on somebody he knew could not fight back because of the situation and because of the physical, um, 
discrepancy between the two. But I, I mean, I've tried to imagine if I could have responded the way he did. I don't think I would have. I honestly don't know. Under the lights and with everybody watching, maybe I would have had the awareness to, you know, hold myself back. But my first thought would have been to, man, tackle him and, and you know, probably get myself put into jail, which is probably why he wouldn't have done it to me. But um, anyway, I'm getting off topic here. But the last thing I want to talk about is the interesting transformation with me. Now, this has been really traumatic for me. I think it's also been traumatic to a lot of people, maybe to a lot of you, because you see the narcissistic, abusive, codependent Karpman triangle being played out here, which stimulates your experience and your reality. And so what was interesting to me is when it first happened, uh, I saw it and I was, I don't, I was traumatized and didn't know why. My first response was to want to beat the crap out of Will Smith because that's the kind of thing my brother would have done. He would have walked up to me when I was performing and he, you know, devalued me in some way. And he used to do that. He used to come home and slap me, you know, across the back of the head as hard as he could. And I'd say, why'd you do that? And he'd say, because I felt like it. So that stimulated that, just the physical abuse, a bigger man uh, picking on a smaller person and physically, not only physically hurting them, but the, the devaluation of, of devaluing you and silencing you when you have been called upon by the powers that be to have this, you know, you're the king in that moment where you're presenting, um, uh, you know, a, a uh, you know, an Oscar at the, you know, that's the, that's the pinnacle. So he is in a real state, Chris Rock is in a real state of, you know, he's in his element and he is uh, recognized as, um, you know, a leader in, you know, the elite in his field. And to have somebody devalue you that way by slapping you and then to talk down to you and yell at you and shame you and shut you down. That was the most abusive part. And that reminded me of my brother. So I was traumatized by that. I then started to try and figure out, I found myself trying to justify that Chris Rock deserved it because it was, you know, nobody gets beat like that unless they did something wrong, right? That's how I, as a codependent, that's how, what comes up. And that's happened to you as well. You're with your borderline or your narcissist and they abuse you. Your first response is to go, I must have done something wrong. I did that all the time with my parents, my brother, whenever I was abused by any of them, my first response was to think I must have deserved it. Somehow I just don't know what it is yet. So the codependent desire to defend the abuser. So when I, when I was thinking about it, um, I became aware, oh, Jada Pinkett has alopecia. Oh, so this is, this is uh, embarrassing for her. Oh, he just made a joke about her alopecia. And then for a while, I was like, well, I guess I get it. You know, he kind of deserved it. He must, I assumed he must have known that he was doing this. Chris Rock was being abusive. After looking at it and thinking about it, especially looking at his response and his behavior, it's clear to me he had no idea. Either he had no idea about the alopecia, or if he did, the joke had nothing to do with that. It was just about... Look at you, your bald head is beautiful. I can't wait to see you showing your strength to the world. That's what that joke was about. He even said that. He said it was a joke about G.I. Jane. He didn't have time to explain it, but the message was, I'm saying your wife is a strong woman. How do you not see that? And then he shuts him down again. He says, don't you know, get your wife's name out your fucking mouth. He goes, I will. Uh, okay. In other words, I can see that he really doesn't understand and he sees that Will Smith is out of his element and there's something wrong with him. And he realizes he's with somebody that's, that's not in his right mind. And what was interesting for me is that I tried to try and I felt guilty. I felt it was a really horrible feeling that I was finding myself wanting to make Chris Rock the guilty person that deserved that nothing could be prevented. He had to be punished for his, his pride, his ego, his hubris. How dare he make fun of the king and queen and how dare he make fun of her alopecia. 
And then the more I thought about it, uh, I became more and more angry at Will Smith and I became more and more traumatized about wanting to go and find Will Smith and crack him over the head, which is about my brother, me wanting to defend myself against my abusive brother. And then the more I thought about it, the more I came to realize and started to feel bad for Will Smith. You know, that this guy has, is so codependent and has chosen to be abused. And then I started thinking, you know, what must be, what must have gone on between him and his mom, you know, and then the, the realization that he himself, that the seeds for this self-destruction has been with him the whole time. And that's why he attracted this abusive woman who is going to play out this scenario where he is emasculated and abused and devalued in front of the whole world. And so this is again him, him, of course, he's reacting to her, you know, to her perfect storm for her, everything worked out exactly the way the narcissist would want. He's looking at, at her as she's feeling victimized for no reason. As you know, borderlines and narcissists do they they make themselves victims when they're not. They accuse people of victimizing them when they're not. Chris Rock could have said, what are you talking about? I just gave you, I just supported you in your struggle and, and, and I empowered you. What do you mean I devalued you? I did the opposite. I was feeling very loving towards you. And it was typical, you know, but the fact that I felt myself feeling bad, feeling guilty and wanting to justify Chris Rock's abuse. And that made me feel real sick inside. And now I'm kind of realizing and seeing my brother, you know, my mom devalued my brother and probably used me when I was an infant, used me to devalue him. And so, um, you know, Will Smith is playing out the role of the abuser, but he's also the codependent. And he's telling you how painful it is to be abused and that, you know, he's trying to say, I'm really a loving guy. In fact, my whole my whole uh, self-esteem comes from being a healer and a loving guy. And, you know, he's not even capable of saying, I'm sorry, Chris Rock. He's not even capable of acknowledging what he's, what he's done. We see more of his self-destruction because, before, you know, he has now resigned from the academy. I think he's trying to do damage control. I think he's trying to get ahead of them saying, don't worry, you don't have to punish me. See, I'm going to punish myself because he obviously doesn't want his Oscar taken away from him, which I don't think they'll take away from him. That would just be too politically incorrect uh, on so many levels. Um, and um, he says, I'm willing to take whatever punishment they give. I noticed, you know, he's not willing to go to jail for what he did. Um, he's not uh, saying, you know, going to the police and saying, you know, I, I struck somebody in the face. I, you know, he's not taking any responsibility for it what he's actually done. He's, he's appealing to the people who have the power to, you know, uh, protect or minimize the damage to his career and his, his public image. Um, that doesn't mean he doesn't honestly feel that, but there's that self, you know, if he, if he wasn't self-destructive, he would just go, you know what, I think it's time for me to just sit back and not do anything. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. But instead he gets ahead of it, says, I resign, please don't hurt me. So uh, anyway, i have now even watching this, you know, this is, this shows our society's narcissistic culture, that things have devolved to this level. And that's what this is. This is a huge devolution. And it shows us how we have created a narcissist. We, you know, we've that we create narcissists and then seek to destroy them, um, that he is as much a victim of this narcissistic society. Uh, you know, I'm sure that, you know, the way we deify uh, celebrities, you know, he's surrounded by his entourage. He's surrounded. He's got, you know, who knows how many millions and millions of dollars he's already got. He's got clout. He can, you know, do anything, get anything, go anywhere. And, um, you know, he's... You know, this creates narcissists in, in, in families. The two ways to create a narcissist is to abuse them, to neglect them, and to 
don't give any boundaries, to constantly give them everything they want all the time. And he's got both of these things going on. So he's got his own narcissism uh, brewing. But, you know, this would never have happened uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. This wouldn't have happened. This shows that the level of narcissism in our society has risen to such a degree that we are playing out our narcissism. We're funneling it through our celebrities. And it'll be interesting to see what happens to him and his career and his marriage after that. Anyway, I've talked long enough. That's it. So that's my gossip for the day. And... Uh, a uh, short thing is here, you know, I'm not going to come on this channel a lot. If you want to heal, do the four things. If you don't do the four things, I don't have any sympathy for you. Uh, but that's where the healing is. And I've already made plenty of videos on what those four things are. If you want to know what they are, you can watch them. Uh, if you want to check out my other channel over here, thunderwizard.com, you can go ahead and check that out. That's it for me. Uh, stay safe. Do the four things and you never have to feel uh, narcissistic abuse pain ever again. All right, guys, take care.